Welcome back, everybody, and thank you for coming to this uh, third session. After two very interesting sessions this morning, we have big shoes, shoes to fill, but uh, we have distinguished panelists with us to respond to this uh, challenge. In the two sessions this morning, we talked about how middle-income countries and the fact that Asia is now dominated by middle-income countries is presenting new challenges and new opportunities, of course, for the region. But uh, we highlighted also that some of these challenges and uh, even the role of the private sector and some of the uh, issues that uh, middle-income countries are facing when uh, considering uh, going up the ladder of uh, economic development, some of these issues cannot be solved only at the country level. So there is more and more an awareness that there is uh, the need for co cooperation at the regional level and for joint efforts among countries to address some of these issues. So some of these issues, uh, of course, are linked to economic development. And trade has been and has always been the first step towards regional cooperation. It has been true in Europe and it's also true in Asia. Asia is not going to be uh, an exception to it. So when we talk about regional cooperation or integration, the first thought we have is to, talk, to think about uh, trade and exchange of goods, services, capital, but there is much more to it than just trade. So trade is definitely essential, but regional cooperation we'll see in our panel discussion is much more to that. If we look at the last decades of, of growth in Asia, and it was mentioned this morning, we can't be just uh, amazed, we, we, are, we have to be amazed at the, the growth of Asia. And uh, it's also an indication that Asia has been um, uh, integrated in the rest of the world. But unfortunately, intra-regional integration has been lagging. And there is really a lot of efforts to be done to uh, catch up on uh, intra-regional integration. So that means such that uh, with the economic uh, slowdown in uh, Europe and the EU, which has been the driving force of uh, Asian development, there is much more awareness and need for uh, Asian countries to look at their regional markets, to look at how they can integrate regional value chains, and how they can make the benefits also, take all the benefits of having middle-income countries that means also middle class and more purchasing power, and then that means that you also more uh, opportunities for markets and uh, cross uh, investment uh, among the different countries. But regional co cooperation, as I said earlier, cannot be just limited to trade and uh, regional uh, uh, economic cooperation. Uh, there is much more at stake here, and investment in uh, infrastructure, investment in cooperation in education, skill development, cooperation in technology, energy cooperation are all part of uh, this uh, regional cooperation that is uh, discussed and that is aimed at. Well, import, uh, regional economic integration is an important part of the puzzle that we talked about this morning. There is actually also another important fear which is the dreaded uh, impact of climate change and environmental issues. And again, that's one of the issues that cannot be solved just at the country level, but has to be solved at the regional level and even at the global level. So to discuss this whole range of issues, we have here four panelists, four distinguished panelists, I would say, who will have different uh, perspective and will be able to, uh, to get to the, uh, their sense of what they think and what their experience tells them about the challenges of regional integration and regional cooperation. We will first look at the challenges that Asia faces when talking about regional cooperation and integration. Then each one of the panelists will give us uh, information about or lessons that they can draw from evaluation or from their own experience. And then we'll see after the discussion with the with the audience how we can use these lessons to look forward and to draw some recommendations for, for the future. So I will start the discussion with you, Nan, <coughs> Mrs. Pinchanok. You are the representative of the Ministry of Commerce and in this panel you are the one who is also the specialist of regional trade. 
you've been negotiating uh, regional trade agreements for Thailand for quite many years and you have a lot of experience in uh, what uh, in regional trade and what it means for a country, a middle income country like Thailand in terms of economic growth. So I would like to have your perspective on uh, regional cooperation and regional integration in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Veronique, and uh, good afternoon to everybody here. It's always a challenge to be uh, speaking the first panel after lunch, uh, but I'm sure that my booming voice and uh, very, I'm a very animated person. Uh, at least I can give you uh, uh, a reckon uh, for like about uh, five, ten minutes. Um, Thank you uh, for the question. And um, before I answer Veronique's question, I think I must uh, say that uh, yes, I had um, I've been um, engaged in uh, trade negotiations uh, for more than 20 years. But um, I have uh, moved on. I have to say that I have moved on, and now I'm doing uh, a broader uh, uh, policy uh, issues. And um, uh, since I've been uh, doing. Um, um, since I've been a Director General for Trade Policy and Strategy Office for uh, uh, one year now, and I was a deputy before that, I think uh, this has um, opened my eyes uh, on a uh, new era or new phase of trade negotiations or regional integration. I think uh, if I have to, uh, you know, if I may be a little bit controversial in the beginning, I think people cannot uh, think of trade or um, economic integration as you have done before. Things are changing very fast and I think uh, uh, Ministry of Commerce in Thailand or other ministries and including um, international organizations that uh, deal with trade issues have to rethink. You know, the world in the future is not going to be uh, the same as the world that we have been uh, experiencing uh, for the past uh, several decades. And I think this is the big challenge and I, I would uh, touch upon some issues. So, uh, but uh, first I have to address the uh, uh, question of whether integration, economic integration has been um, useful <coughs> for Asia and for ASEAN and for Thailand. The answer is uh, emphatically yes, of course. We have seen that the uh, benefits of um, Trade integration um, has uh, led to increased export in um, Asia, uh, regional, uh, intra-Asian trade as well as intra-ASEAN trade. Um, I can give you an example that um, uh, in the past 10 years, intra-Asian trade has grown uh, at 7.55%, while intra-ASEAN trade has grown at uh, 5 .5%. 5.46%. Maybe uh, at the aggregate level, it doesn't uh, appear to be very high, but when we take a closer look at country, in each country, for example, like a country in ASEAN, the intra um, ASEAN trade, uh, you know, the, how we trade with each other has uh, grown like in double digit. Uh, for example, Thailand, Vietnam is like 11% and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, commensurate to the uh, ex um, to the growth of uh, regional trade, uh, we have seen the uh, growth of uh, GDP. Uh, I'm not an expert on GDP. I saw um, colleagues from uh, Ministry of Finance today. I'm sure he will be talking about that. But anyway, I think uh, the the, uh, the benefit is there. Yes, and should we continue on integration? Yes, but uh, in what form of integration? What do you mean by integration? Integration in the future would not be the same as integration that we have been talking and doing in the past. Uh, decades. We are no longer focusing, at least uh, in my view, we shouldn't be focusing only on tariff integration, for example. It's, um, it's uh, moving down a lot and it, uh, in the future, uh, apart from things like rules of origin, uh, trading goods would be uh, uh, more or less uh, moving uh, quite freely. But we have um, many challenges in the future like uh, digital technology. I think these are uh, from my perspective, dealing with uh, trade issues, I can see uh, uh, that it is uh, it's going to be a very, very big influence um, on trade and investment, in not only in Asia, but in <coughs> other countries as a whole. Other issues that I think we have to rethink um, 
about uh, what I may call, you know, to be like in fashion in Thailand, everything is a uh, 4.0. I want to call them uh, trade 4.0. We have to rethink and include um, issues like um, uh, digital trade and um, investment integration, investment and competition policy. It will become important in the future because uh, uh, everybody would need to have a level uh, but fair playing field. Um, issues such as human development for me, for Thailand, will be very, very crucial because Thailand is going to be in an aging economy in five years. We no longer can afford to uh, support or promote a group of industries that are labor intensive. We have to move out of that um, uh, for me if Thailand is going to uh, have future, um, you know, in and competition in, in the in the near future would be very fierce, but uh, for Thailand, we, we have many challenges, um, um, not only on aging society, but uh, on technological education. So I think um, all these issues uh, we will help, will reshape how we see uh, trade and economic integration. It will not be uh, goods, it will be uh, more services, it will be on people, it will be on digital integration, it will be on um, um, some, what I would call um, institutional policy integration. I, I, I can't find a proper word, but uh, like regulation, it has to be converged or, uh, you know, there must be some convergence of uh, rules in, um, among countries. So uh, the hard integration such as road and uh, physical connectivity will have to be there for countries to, to reap benefit, but we also will have to focus on soft uh, integration or connectivity in the future. So I will just uh, stop here as my first round. But uh, okay. yeah, just um, maybe one one more word that I would like uh, to depart you with is that future, in the future we can not uh, disregard issues such as sustainability and inclusivity because these are the uh, uh, I in my personal view these are the uh, causes of. Uh, what difficulties the world is going through today, we have so many conflicts that have impact on trade and, and stuff like that. Uh, we would need to have uh, things that uh, Dr. Poi has called, I just found it in the, on the, the, the cover of the book that you gave me, I really appreciate it. He said there are four things uh, people have to focus, efficiency, um, freedom, justice, and kindness. I think kindness or inclusivity will be the, one of the key issues that we have to address in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for highlighting the fact that uh, there is a difference between regional cooperation and regional integration. When we talk about cooperation, it's actually changing goods, services, and it's agreeing on known tariffs, maybe also agreeing on some of uh, uh, behind the borders uh, regulations. But integration means really deciding on a set of regulations and laws that are going to decide and be uh, imposed in a way on the different countries. And that's actually where we come to Europe because Europe is one of the most integrated regions in the world. Uh, it's actually, trade has been the beginning of Europe with steel and uh, coal right after World War II. So trade was definitely the, the first step, but uh, Europe has been evolving uh, over decades, the last decades, and uh, with ups and downs, and actually we are maybe in this uh, troubled time where we don't know whether it's going up or down, but uh, it's a good example, and we have here uh, Jan William uh, von der Kaij from uh, the uh, European Investment Bank, who can give us the uh, perspective or the experience from Europe, but not only the experience of Europe, but also the, the experience of the European investment bank, so a bank that has been operating in a context of middle-income countries and in a context of an already integrated region. So Jan William, please. Okay, thank you, Veronica. I will try first starting with uh, the, the, the bigger foundation that is Europe and then coming later on to the EIB in specifically. Yeah, I think we are now with Europe, uh, people ask, uh, well, is, is the European integration, is that a success or a failure? <coughs> well, I'm very, uh, I'm an optimistic person anyway, but I think that I can say firmly, yes, I think that overall Europe is a success. And we're talking about how integration started, eh, with trade, eh, 
uh, steel and coal bring the industries of Germany and France together. We, have, we should not forget that at the very beginning, the very big intention of Europe, of the European integration, was in fact to establish peace in Europe after the devastation of the Second World War. And if you take that into account and look that after the establishment of the EU, which started as a European community, the EC, we have now there in Europe a, a period of six years of peace. And when you look six years back from 1955 onwards, uh, 57 onwards, what a, what a difference that has given. I think in that sense you can say that it is a real success. We should not forget. And of course there are ups and downs. We have gone now through a, also a difficult period. First we had a good period with getting the enlargement from well, six countries to, 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 to 11, 12, to all the Eastern European countries to 28. Maybe uh, a couple of years we are back to 27. But uh, it has grown. Then we have seen in an economic sense problems, in particular uh, the financial crisis, which was in particular was hitting the countries in the south of Europe very hard, hardly. And of course we have now, let's say, more political dimension with uh, the, the looming uh, Brexit. And behind Brexit, when you look to other countries, there's also, let's say, the, the, uh, the relations between the European Union, the institution of the European Union, and its citizens. I think that's an issue which we have to, to address, how we can bridge the gap between the European citizens and uh, uh, what we are doing at uh, European institutions. Uh, then you look to the last uh, 60 years of, uh, and we try to, to get some lessons from the European experience. Because I'm not saying that although Europe is the most integrated area of the world, that we should do everything like it has been done, no. On the contrary, but we can draw some lessons. And I've taken together, the say, four lessons. And the first is, it was already said, that integration has several dimensions. It starts with trade, but you have also the financial integration, you have monetary integration, you have cooperation integration on the, in the regulatory scene, and, of course, uh, the political one. But we should realize that those uh, different uh, aspects um, should not all necessarily follow the same speed. Uh, trade goes for, went faster in Europe than, let's say, the, the, the financial integration that also came across, but now the political is, is looming behind. Secondly, I think it's important, I already mentioned, that uh, integration should be done in a democratic way, in the sense that you keep your citizen on board and that institutions remain accountable uh, to its citizens. Well, there are a lot of Evaluates here, so when they were, they were accountable, they are all very happy. But I think it's very important to, uh, to have that uh, in mind. The third one is that uh, integration always, with integration, it runs the risk that you start to become inward looking. No, you should avoid to become a fortress. You have to realize that with integration regionally, you also have to look to the external side. And last but not least, I think that integration should be based on what we call Europe the principle of subsidiarity. That means that you have to see which activities can be done at which level. There are activities which should be done at the local level. There, should be, uh, there are a lot of activities which should remain at the uh, country level, because they are very country specific. And there are areas, issues which are much better to do that at the European level. And there, to, to determine how you do that, and I think I, I will elaborate a little bit on this issue of, of subsidiarity because it, it looks, uh, it, it sounds very technically but it is not in the end. You have to, to, with each action you are performing, you have to ask yourself the question, well, does this action have transnational aspects that cannot be resolved by individual countries, but should be done at the EU level? Would national action or the absence of European action be contrary to the European treaty? Or, and a third one is, does action at the EU le uh, level have clear advantages? And I can also use here, you may say, have, should that have, or can it have added value? And if it has, then go to the European level. But don't think automatically we all uh, bring it up to the highest level, because then you're losing in the end, and I think that was also the risk we saw in Europe, that you start to lose your citizens. This is about Europe. I think that for, for, well, lessons is a big word, but for aspects I think we should take into account. Now, I don't yeah. go into the ERB. 
the ERB. Um, in fact, the, the issue of, now let's say that the ERB is a multilateral bank, and I think it's the example of a multilateral bank being active in middle and high income countries. So if you ask me the question, do you think there is a future for uh, international financial institutions in high and middle income countries? I think when you look at the, the example of the ERB, my answer is yes. That's reassuring for the Asian Development Bank. Yeah, so yeah. And I can give, and maybe later on we can come back to that, uh, but I think the, the name of the game is added value, or in fact also subsidiarity. It is very important when you as an IFI operate in a high or middle income country that you really realize yourself the things I'm doing here, that do they add value to the country, to our clients. It can also be the private sector. And if not, don't do it because you're starting to be a competitor of the private sector. But when you look at the, the EIB, I think we have gone more and more in the direction of trying to uh, we have position ourselves as an, we call it a crowding in bank. Uh, we give some financial, non-financial benefits to our clients, uh, private sector, public sector. People like to do that. But in the end, the most important is that we leverage public and private sector investments. And we do that with a whole new range of instruments, not only with debt instruments, but also with quasi-equity and equity uh, uh, instruments and take more risks. And I will stop here to give you one example. Maybe you've heard about the Juncker plan. And after the financial crisis, it was the new uh, chair of the Commission, the European Commission, came with an investment plan for Europe. And then with, an, with uh, combining guarantees for the European budget, around 20 billion. He wanted to, uh, to trigger investment of 350 billion over three years. That's 2% of the GDP of Europe, of, all, of the whole EU, in, 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 uh, in, in a three years period. And we did it, and we are still trying to do that with bringing together guarantees from the European budget with the own resource of the bank. And in that sense, uh, we are really um, uh, triggering uh, those, uh, those uh, investments. The jury is still out. Maybe later we come to talk about the evaluation. We have done a midterm uh, review of this plan. Well, it was too early to call for results, but I think once again what we saw is the word added value is very important. Uh, additionality, what do you think you can add uh, with your actions to the economy? And here I saw. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Jan William. I think that it's actually interesting to look at examples of other countries or other regions like uh, Europe uh, to either become pessimistic, optimistic, <coughs> or realistically optimist, as we said <laughs> earlier. But they are different uh, in defi definitely in the history of Europe. Uh, a lot of lessons to be drawn that could be used by, uh, in, uh, in other countries like Asia. Uh, I'm turning to you now, Vinod Thomas. Uh, you are now a visiting professor at the National University of Singapore, but you've been vice president at the World Bank, and more recently you were the director general of the Independent Evaluation Department at ADB. And uh, we're going to be talking uh, about a topic that's really close to your heart, and uh, that also has a lot of uh, I mean, regional and global dimension, of course, which is the, the topic of climate change. And uh, the... Uh, challenge of uh, environment, environmental uh, uh, degradations and issues. So all of these uh, shared risks are shared risk by the, the whole countries and they are issues that are not limited to the border of a country. They are transboundaries and they are multi-sectoral impacts uh, of climate change or environmental issues. Uh, you have written recently a book on uh, climate change and natural disasters. You definitely call for more regional cooperation on issues like water management, uh, energy, and uh, there is a lot actually that you have to say on the need for more regional cooperation and integration on these issues. So I'd like to have your perspective on this, Vinod. Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> Veronique. Great to be part of this panel and uh, also to hear about the work of various people doing quite related to the discussion of this uh, 
panel which is going in a very complementary way in the sense that different people are emphasizing aspects that dovetail. So I want to make a broad connection with that before mentioning a bit more on climate change in the few minutes. And the big a broad connection is that, I mean, you could ask the question, if the world was just one and we just had one currency and people could just flow from place to place with no restrictions, uh, would the welfare be better? And we can discuss this quite a bit. You can clearly see some differences that will emerge. Some may not like it as much as others. And the aggregate welfare that is taken together is likely to be better. Uh, but the differences across people probably going to be very, very difficult and controversial. So we have differences. But regional cooperation, for one thing, a little bit more of a no-brainer, but regional integration as well are ways in which you try to capture those benefits we are losing by not being one world or not being one region or not being even one whole country. So that's what we are trying to do. Cooperation, especially with respect to information sharing and so on, who could be against that? Integration in terms of regulatory frameworks, all nicely uh, laid out in the earlier comments. Um, uh, there are pluses and minuses and we struggle with how much to do. Organizations like the ADB, uh, anal analytical work from Samasat and others, all of them, uh, and evaluations from 3IE, uh, all of them try to get at this. But one finding I wanted to put on the table, which is surprising to me, which is regional integration efforts, uh, they produce some difficulties. They produce some costs. They produce uh, some... Uh, hesitation in working together. So to put together projects that cover more than one country, many of the people in operations would say, well, this is too much trouble. It's not worth it. Sometimes we have to go to the lowest common denominator. So there are these piling costs of having projects that are cross-boundary trade, uh, health, uh, and so on. So the question could be asked, well, taking that into account, are these projects better for those types of uh, themes than if it were just a single country? And we found something quite striking that uh, we can look at this critically, that those that had regional integration built into it, 81% of those in a large sample had success rates, whereas the ones that didn't have those features had only, if I remember right, 60, uh, in one case, 59%. Okay. A different study also said that when you have co-financing, which means more than one partner coming in with the financing, and they only bring, not only bring financing, they also bring knowledge. So those, again, had 81% success. And in that case, uh, those, of those, those projects without co-financing had uh, 57%. Uh, those differences are significant, right? So um, <clears throat> the question has to be asked, uh, why is that? Now, a practical example, a no-brainer maybe, uh, a disease control project, this is the HIV, Cambodia, Laos, and uh, Vietnam together. That was a very successful project. Uh, and clearly, the nature of the disease uh, transmission is such that regional is better than one country. So that was a clear case. But there are more subtle ones where this problem that Managers say, look, if I have to get together with several groups, whether they are partners in financing or partners uh, in delivering, it takes too long to come up with terms of reference, it's too long to agree on what we want to do, and uh, capacities vary. Those difficulties are overwhelmed by the gains you could achieve by getting the benefit of more than two pairs of eyes looking at the project um, and the nature of the project such that if one country lags, the overall gains are not going to be great and so on. So I'm making a case that we need to be very openly looking at the potential benefits of regional integration projects that could, not always, but that could overwhelm the cost that it takes longer time. This point is often ignored in operational discussions. Now, having said that, a brief word, a couple of minutes, right? A brief word on the mother of all uh, so-called externalities that make regional and global essential. So there are varying degrees. Trade, yeah, we should have. Uh, information sharing, yes, we should have. 
uh, having uh, uh, making shoes and selling them across the border. It would be have, it would be good to have information sharing. But even if you didn't, people will private sector will do the things that are needed to make this happen. So there is a question: how much to push beyond what would have happened anyway? But there are some areas where private sector will not do enough. Some are on the positive side and some are on the negative side. On the positive side, vaccination. If I vaccinate it, not only do I benefit, but everybody benefits. But I have to go somewhere to get it done. So you underperform on vaccinations, primary education, and a whole list of things. Those, especially across boundaries, can, can lag. And so there is a clear case on the positive side to do those things that grace the benefits to all and uh, health is really a quintessential area. The other one, the what I call the mother of our externalities, on the negative side, pollution. Um, and that means if you don't um, clean up your upstream water, those downstream will suffer. But you have not much of an incentive to do that unless you say, look, this is a regional integration or a global integration project and we need to uh, come together and do so. Are the gains worth the cost? Huge. Because this would not happen automatically. And so when the Trump administration says, uh, we, yeah, there may be uh, climate change, and uh, it may even be man-made, but the private sector will offer the best solution. They're missing a key point that because these are so-called, in the economic jargon, negative externalities, what I do, I don't take into account the harm it causes to the others. There is a room for regulation and smart, and effective and efficient regulation. This is sound economics. This is not fluffy economics, but one that is often forgotten by uh, uh, the, the decision makers. And so climate change is the top one. I'll close with a reason why climate change action lags uh, the scientific knowledge by such large amount. One, people think this is in the distant future, and that is not true anymore. Thailand would vouch for it. The Pacific Island case has made that point. Number two, uh, you think that the uh, harm is for other people and not for us, so we can wait. And that, again, is not true. Southeast Asia and Asia are the biggest hit by climate change. And number three, the thinking that it affects growth. In this morning session, there was a discussion of that. But here, the big point is that not only is it something that you could go with growth, but the way climate change is impacting, especially from some of the presentations on uh, the performance of countries, East, Southeast Asia and Asia will not be able to grow at 5 to 6 percent in the future if climate change and, and sustainability of the environment were not addressed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vinod, and thank you for highlighting the fact that it's not just uh, about uh, regional cooperation for the sake of it, that it actually makes a lot of business sense. <coughs> to work together and to develop the region, not just in terms of economic benefits, but also in terms of existential benefits. Actually, we are reaching that level where it's they become it's not only an opportunity, but definitely a necessity to look at some issues more regionally. Thank you also for highlighting the lessons from evaluation, showing that even even though regional projects or programs may look more complex and more costly at once, there are actually benefits for them and working uh, more uh, regionally. And that actually will lead us uh, to our last uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Manny Jimenez. You are the director of the 3IE uh, organization, which is the International Initi Initiative on Impact Evaluation, an organization that promotes evaluation almost like a, as a good, a public good. So you will be echoing what Vinod would just say, that actually all of these lessons and the knowledge that we can get from evaluation should be more shared, should be used also more uh, in terms of uh, uh, identifying uh, regional area, uh, areas for regional cooperation and integration. So um, Manny, actually, what is your perspective on the role that evaluation can play in regional cooperation? And more importantly, what is the, the value of knowledge and knowledge from evaluation for middle-income countries and a region like Asia? Uh, thanks very much, Veronique, and thanks again to uh, the ADB and Thomasat University for hosting me here. Uh, I'd like to follow my good friend Vinod here in, in various panels because you often complement each other 
so he's talked a lot about diseases. He's talked about the catastrophe of global climate change, the public bads that have to be addressed regionally and globally. I want to talk about the public good, which is uh, knowledge and, uh, and, and uh, make the same point. Uh, we heard all throughout this morning how the key to moving up uh, either to escape the middle income trap, but if you don't believe in that, at least to go from middle income to high income, is to enhance productivity uh, by generating knowledge that will really add value uh, to the economy. So I just want to make two points on this. One is in the private sector and one is on the, on the public sector. Of course, there's a great incentive for people to be creative because there are private returns to it. But the problem with knowledge is that it's not excludable. At least you can't, once it's known, you can't prevent others from benefiting from it. And the other is, once you consume it, it can still be consumed by someone else. So the private returns to investing in this could be very little unless there is regulation, as my colleagues pointed out. Uh, so a lot of countries have patents and trademarks to address this exactly. But the issue on the regional side, uh, Veronique, uh, is that uh, what happens across borders? Uh, we all know about patent infringements uh, across various countries that should go unnamed, uh, about Harry Potter knockoffs in other countries. Uh, how do you address that? So one point I want to make is that, yes, uh, there is a great need uh, to uh, engage in uh, knowledge and R&D, uh, but that it has to be done in a regional way, integrated way, to make sure that these cross-border effects are, are being met. The second point I wanted to make is just on the, on the public sector and, and why evaluation is, uh, is important. Now, when you think about productivity and creativity, you often don't think of it in the same way, the same way as in the public sector. Those two are often not conflated together. But when you have economies that are one-third to at least an OECD, a half, or in the public sector in terms of spending, you have to be concerned about whether the public sector itself is creative. But how do you know that they're being creative? How do you know what works? In the private sector, it's pretty easy. They go out of business if they don't. In the public sector, you have to have other metrics because they have other objectives. And that's why evaluation, the kind of things that IED does, the kind of things that we do, and let me just because you invited me, Marvin, I would have said that anyway. Uh, it's really, really key to doing this because what it does is it holds people accountable for results. And secondly, and I think even more importantly, it helps people learn. And this is a regional public good, I would argue, because what we learn globally is perhaps not as valuable as what we learn regionally from countries that are more similar to each other. Let me give you an example of uh, one uh, public sector innovation that has spread very widely. So we talked this morning about social protection and how important that is if uh, economies uh, uh, in the middle income state uh, really want to address greater productivity in the future so that people have a safety net. So in, in the mid-1990s, Mexico wanted to shift from a very inefficient, very costly food subsidy scheme to one that would target investments in transfers to the poor, but also incentivize their population to invest in human capital, in education and health. And they thought up the conditional cash transfer program, which was alluded to earlier, which basically said we will give transfers to poor people if they invest, keep their kids in secondary school, and if they bring their kids for immunizations and so on and so forth. Now, this was evaluated very rigorously, not just by the government itself, but by external people. The Mexican government commissioned this work. And as a result of this, this program now spread widely, initially across all of Latin America, to Colombia and Brazil, the Bolsa Familia and everything else. And now, because of regional effects, it's even spread to East Asia, which initially, if you recall maybe 10 years ago, to them, social protection was anathema to East Asia because they were afraid that this would actually make their people lazy, our people come from the Philippines. Uh, and uh, I know this because we tried to sell this program to the country. Initially, the point is that, oh, we were criticized by, this was a dole-out program, ADB and the World Bank came to this. 
But I think when they saw the arguments from the evaluation and the fact that from a political economy point of view, this was not a total handout, but that the poor people had to actually invest in themselves to do it, it gained political traction. So my point is that the evaluations that showed that as a result of this program, that people invested in their own uh, human capital actually led to sustainability of this program and also to its spread, not just to that country, but to other countries. Well, thank you very much for this big support for evaluation. That's definitely making the point on the usefulness of evaluation. So we had a different perspective here, but all quite positive about trade and uh, the leading role also of Thailand in, uh, in uh, favoring regional cooperation. We had uh, even, despite the uh, current context, we had a positive also perspective on integration, regional integration in Europe. Uh, Vinoda highlighted the fact that regional cooperation can be uh, a positive and should be a positive element uh, and that actually there are more benefits from working regionally than from working individually. And also uh, the good point from many about the importance of knowledge, knowledge including knowledge coming from evaluation. So all of those are very positive uh, pictures. But we all know also that uh, it's not a given that there will be more and more regional cooperation and more and more integration. We actually also see the risk of uh, regional fragmentation. Well, Brexit is only one element and hopefully I share actually also your view, Jan William, that hopefully it may actually become a you know, positive element if it strengthens uh, Europe. But, but we can see even in, a, in an old regional integration structure or architecture like Europe, there are actually threats. It's true also in uh, South Asia, it's, tr it's true in ASEAN. So rapidly, actually, could you highlight if um, maybe your perspective on that? Do you think that there is a risk of regional fragmentation and not just regional uh, kind of a nice uh, trend towards more regional in integration? None maybe uh -oh. in the region. <laughs> <laughs> To start it off, um, you know, um, of course. Do you think uh, there is a risk in ASEAN? Yeah, like I tell John William, I, I call them our challenges. You know, it's uh, something that we have to overcome. Um, you know, not all is well with integration, but uh, I, I believe that uh, integration will happen anyway. You cannot stop it because of uh, technology, because of like. Transport. You know, people travel all around the world. Uh, digital integration is taking place uh, every day. We know, uh, like, um, I talked to uh, your uh, organizer in the Philippines without seeing him several times. Um, so integration will occur naturally. We cannot stop it. But um, will it be beneficial to everybody, everyone? No. The answer is no. And for me, that is uh, the important challenge. Um, uh, that comes by to, to your point about inclusive uh, integration. Inclusive and um, I think um, it, um, for me, when I think about inclusivity, I'm not thinking in theoretical term only. You know, I'm, I'm a practitioner. When I sometimes, you know, frankly, when I listen to uh, people in uh, like uh, from the World Bank or ADB talking about inclusivity in a very abstract term, you know, it, it gives me a oh, I want uh, World Bank or ADB or IMF to come up with something that is really concrete, you know, that will reduce our increased inclusivity. For example, we have to uh, highlight the fact that uh, challenges will be faced by farmers in the country such as Thailand, where uh, the majority of our export is from industrial sectors, but uh, uh, more, uh, about 50% of our population is still engaged in farming sector, and they are the ones who are at disadvantage with, uh, with or uh, without this integration. Like I said, integration will continue, but we have to uh, really think about uh, who are getting left behind. And for me, farmers, SMEs, they are really uh, at the disadvantage yeah. uh, from this integration. I think we have to, to address those. Another issue that uh, I would like to um, uh, highlight um, is um, education. Um, it's been discussed here in Thailand a lot that uh, education, um, uh, we are lacking behind education. Well, I'm not an expert in education, you know. I didn't even graduate from Thailand University. 
So I'm, I'm not uh, in a position to criticize. You know, I just uh, graduated uh, from high school here. Um, but uh, I can see that uh, it's a, a challenge that are uh, common in many developing countries. So um, I would say that it's something that uh, ADP or other organizations should uh, really take up in order to reduce the, uh, the uh, you know, to address the challenges. Yeah. And lastly, I think um, the, the question of another maybe controversial issue, government, government officials like me have to be reformed. You know, we cannot uh, think of uh, controlling or regulating. When I heard uh, Mr. Vinod or uh, even uh, my colleague from uh, Europe talk about more and more regulation. No, we cannot in the future uh, because uh, technological integration will take place and it will uh, making government officials like me redundant. You know, I'm sure uh, computer will be able to do the tariff negotiation very well in the future. It's like a chase. You just key in one number and you will see all the changes and you can talk to the Chinese uh, counterpart. Yeah, I want uh, this. Uh, did uh, HS code to down to 0.5%, you know, blah, blah, blah. You don't need uh, people uh, or government officials in certain things. And so we have to uh, reform our mind. We have to facilitate rather than regulate. Things in the future will uh, occur uh, out of uh, government realms. Uh, it will be more on business side, will be on uh, normal people. So government of officials have to uh, be reformed too. They have to uh, think out of the box and they have to uh, have like more facilitating uh, as the top priority rather than regulating because uh, uh, the world is not going that way. No, the world is going to be loose structure. We have to, to prepare for that. So maybe the ADB also can come up with something that would help government uh, reform or at least to try to uh, redirect our thinking uh, so that we will be ready for, for the future. Just a uh, uh, you know, few of my thoughts here. Yeah, thank you very much and thank you for highlighting the fact that uh, some part of the population within Asia may actually be a very, not skeptical, but even feared by the prospect of more regional cooperation. Definitely farmers, micro enterprises and small enterprises because they are not necessarily equipped to face uh, regional uh, uh, cooperation and integration and a good point also about uh, changing the mind frame and uh, although actually I would say that a real a good regulation would be a regulation that facilitates right? not a regulation that constrains so I don't see the necessary dichotomy but you are right that very often regulation don't necessarily facilitate. Yeah, just one minute to <laughs> I was in Brussels for three and a half years and the EU Commission, they always think of more and more and more and more regulation, you know, it yeah, really strangle our export. But that's <laughs> a very good point, that that's actually a threat. The <laughs> EU, the EU Commission think of how best to, uh, uh, be, you know, to keep animal welfare, you know, but, uh, okay, I, I'm animal lover, but, uh, you know, they, they think too much. <laughs> Maybe they yeah, think too much. <laughs> Jen William, do you think that actually in Europe we think too much? Pardon that? Do you think that we think too much at the European Union? No, not that we think too much. <laughs> I'm not well enough. Think, Overregulating. <laughs> Overregulating too much because uh, what Nam just expressed, I think, is also, let's say, an express you often hear generally from the public, uh, from the citizen in, yes. in, in, in Europe. That was, I think, also one of the... Uh, the issues behind the fact that even now in the last Lisbon Treaty, the word subsidiarity was taken on board. Eh? Yeah. Because there was this feeling that there was an, uh, an ever-increasing uh, uh, machine working somewhere in Brussels which produced in one way or another suddenly new regulations and where people in the country didn't and know anymore. And it's always anymore. the fault of Brussels. Okay. Yeah, and then it was always because, well, it is not only integration, but... It, in the world at the moment, you, you'll see more, uh, generally there is dissatisfaction with the uh, with public and uh, they are uh, forging their criticism of variety uh, to, the, to the leaders, but also to more far away bureaucracies like, like, uh, like the EU. Yeah. Thank you. But yeah. no, please. About, about this, uh, uh, these issues, well, of course, in the ideal world, we would also like to see development being a smooth line going up and up and up and up. Mm -hmm. 
without any uh, setbacks. But we all know that history doesn't work like that. The effect maybe when you look back, whatever you talk about, you need maybe problems to take a, a, two steps further, to go further. Yeah. And uh, it, problems make you think, and I think that it is important. For example, what we have seen in, 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 in Europe is, uh, uh, oh, let me say it in a different way. Brexit, you're talking about Brexit. I think that Brexit is a kind of uh, uh, watershed in, 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 in the European history because I think it was the first time since we started in the 57 with this integration project that people said, hey, it is not only that we can only, we, that we will only integrate more and more deep and more countries. And it's the first time that, we, hey, there's a possibility we are not going from 6 to 15 to 20 to 28. But it's also possible to go back from 28 to 27. So that was, I think, a kind of mental shock for a lot of uh, people to, to see that happening. The same happens with, uh, let's say, the moder monetary integration or the... Uh, MU is still, uh, and I think remains with <coughs> the same number or will increase at a certain moment. The problems <coughs> Europe was facing in, 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 in Greece didn't realize that monetary integration was not something which would, have, which would go on <coughs> smoothly without taking other measures more in the economic field to help to support <coughs> those countries which were, let's say, less uh, strong in the economic development to, yeah. in order to, to, to keep the monetary union uh, together. And I think that Nan mentioned the words uh, inclusive integration, and I think that's, that's very important. Yeah? You've seen it in Europe with, with Greece, that we need inclusive integration. Um, and you also see that when I'm talking about my bank, the European Investment Bank, <coughs> and about the EU in general, that one of the main uh, objectives have always been what we call social and economic cohesion in the EU, mm -hmm. yeah? trying to, to bring those parts of Europe which are behind yeah. to bring them up. Disparities among Disparities to, to, to fight disparities. And I think yeah. if we don't do that and if we <coughs> disregard the, I think the increasing inequality in the world but also in Europe, I think we're on the wrong side. So yeah. I think that's that is, very that much is, in, yeah. in fact. Disparities in and inequality may be a, a, a risk as much as an opportunity also for regional cooperation yeah. and integration. Uh, Vino, that you wrote about uh, your perspective on th potential threats for two or threat to regional cooperation and integration that may really be a challenge for global issues or public goods. Right. <clears throat> um, thank you. Uh, I was thinking that this panel is going to be all agreement on it, all all things, but I think. Kung, uh, I think Chanok said something which I wanted to oh, comment on, if it's okay. Uh, I, I, on, on the regulation, the general picture clearly is that probably too much uh, ineffective regulation uh, that uh, we want to streamline. But I think we really have to make a distinction between uh, good regulation and yes. bad regulation, okay. such as good cholesterol is something you want more of, but bad cholesterol is what you want to cut. So when the Trump administration uh, cuts the Environmental Protection Agency by 31 percent, that is missing the point that cleaner water and cleaner air will not happen automatically. I wish it would happen by goodness of people's hearts, but it doesn't uh, because you are less concerned about the effect you have on others. So that's why we have red lights, uh, although people would try to avoid accidents, but the red lights guide you to making sure that it doesn't happen too much or vaccinations and so on that I mentioned earlier. So um, the case for this kind of intervention, it should not be viewed as something negative. Uh, it obviously has to be done well. And so we have a history is full of bad examples of heavy gov government hand and the failure of government intervention compared to market intervention may be even bigger. But that said, going forward and linking back to the discussion of this morning's uh, middle income trap, it's critical that we don't take a view that going from low income to middle income to high income is a simple matter of linearly doing everything that we did uh, without controlling, sustain, improving sustainability, without improving inclusion and without improving governance. We need to create, facilitate or create uh, mechanisms uh, to make sure that the society is more inclusive, 
uh, that it's more sustainable uh, and the governance improves. Uh, otherwise, it's not only a, an undesirable situation, but the growth of Thailand and Southeast Asia and Asia, as we have known it, will not f be possible because of the, <coughs> of the constraints that are being po uh, put on the countries from climate change, from inequality, and all of this then relates to the question of integration as well. I think maybe a, 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 a panelists have given uh, lots of feedback on the question from uh, Veronique. But um, <clears throat> if, if, uh, if you take a country, a big country like uh, India, there are parts of the country who would probably feel uh, that you are held back into your full potential by being part of the large, and some who feel that you are furthered by being part of the full. And so um, the differences across regions and countries are very different uh, with respect to what they would like to see in terms of integration. But taken together, it is probably the case that more integration brings uh, better welfare for the aggregate, but a lot of differences across groups. I would like to, before we come to questions from the audience, who would like to <coughs> see many if you have any feedback on what evaluation says about it. So, so one reaction and then two threats. Yes. Uh, the reaction is uh, on uh, the debate, so to speak, that you've just been had on, on, on regulation. This is precisely why evaluation is needed. Because there have been evaluations, for example, even in India, of what makes for good regulatory control of emissions. There are some bad ways, a good ways of doing that, and certainly evaluation is, is key. Let me just mention two threats, though, uh, in today's world, as, as I see it, on uh, this learning agenda that I'm trying to, uh, to push. Uh, one is, uh, in order uh, to address knowledge as a regional public good, it needs public subsidies, and I would argue international public subsidies, because it is a public good. In a world where, shall we say, people think we're in a post-truth environment, the appetite for learning what actually works is less than it was. So I think that is one threat that I think it argues all the more for this kind of evaluation. The second threat is the self-confidence of, of governments. One of the key ways to ensure that this kind of learning loop sustains itself is to make sure that the evaluations and the data are publicly available in a transparent way so that others can check on your results and come to their own conclusions. That takes an extraordinary amount of self-confidence in a public sector that arguably may not already be in a very risk-taking mood in terms of creativity. But people have done it, and there are ways to do it, and we can talk a little bit about later, but those are two threats that I see going forward. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think we've touched on a lot of topics, but I'm sure that there are even more questions from the, from the audience. So we'll take a series of three questions, and we'll see also the questions coming from the Pigeon Hall. Uh, with reference to the most integrated region in the world, it reminds me of a remark given by one of the EU officials who paid a visit to our Faculty of Economics. He mentioned that in fact, a single currency union is not the final objective of this integration, but rather the political union is the ultimate one. That reminds me, so I would like to ask, even though it seems quite remote, that if a single currency union turns into a political union, how will it affect the global social, economic, and political environment, even though it's quite remote. But if you think we should not pay attention to this kind of, you know, uh, remote uh, question, then I wouldn't mind that if you don't answer. Thank you. Well, I think that's actually not a remote question in Europe. That's definitely uh, the heart. Uh, 
On, uh, on Europe, but uh, any of the panelists is free to react so the, about this political going beyond the single currency and going towards a more political integration. That's a very hot topic these days in, in Europe. Uh, then we have a question on uh, evaluation, and, the, and that would be more for the evaluators here, and we have uh, uh, many, and maybe Vinod or Jan William also who can talk about it. And regulation, sustainability, maybe Nam, you, you would be able to give your perspective on it. Jan William, do you want to start? Yes, well, this was an, uh, a very interesting question, and I think it's not only a question which is uh, uh, presently very uh, 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 valid and important, but I think it, it, it's a question which I think has dominated the debate about the, the monetary union uh, from the beginning. In fact, uh, just to go a little bit back, there were two schools of thought in Europe at the beginning of the monetary union and also still now. The first one is to say, okay, uh, we start um, uh, with, an with a monetary union and because of the, 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 the requirements that this monetary union, union uh, um, asks for, we will grow <coughs> gradually into a political union. While well, others say, no, 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 we should not do it in that way. In fact, they said, and they lost the battle, in fact, they said, no, you, in fact, you need first a kind of political union or an economic union before you can come to a, to, to a monetary union. Uh, so it is a an, an, an debate which goes on for, already for a long time. Um, but let's assume now that we will uh, grow into a political union. Uh, then the question was, how does it, uh, is this good or bad? I assume this is good or bad for, for the world, I think. Uh, uh, and I think that depends very, very much about how such a union would behave. I said at the beginning, when I was referring to four lessons learned, that uh, we should be uh, careful not to become which our regional integration kind of fortress. I think the same holds true for a monetary union. You can see a monetary union as a kind of part of a, let's say, global system where you, which will be dominated by a couple of of currencies which might work together very well. Yeah. Or you can say, well, it will be part, it will be an, an, a separate union which is much more in competition with the rest. Yeah. And where there is no uh, 
IMF or in the, the body uh, doing the same kind of task as the IMF to see how you cooperate in that sense. So I think it's very much depending on how this monetary political union would, uh, would uh, evolve. It's not a very uh, uh, concrete answer, but I think it's very difficult to look in the future. Definitely different types of uh, political uh, trends behind it. Uh, Vinod, would you like to respond on the evaluation, maybe? Or, um, okay. or any of the other questions that you feel inspired by? I think Lani no, might Lani. Uh, do the evaluation. Would you okay. like to comment on the sustainability? Is that of course, the, yeah. I, I wonder if the number of uh, votes were on sustainability of the whole development or environment? It's or more, the, the question and the in the pigeonhole is more about um, the cost on a, in a way of sustainable development when you are a country with limited resources. Environmental sustainability. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. It's not specifically, but sustainable development with limited yeah. financial resources yeah. and lack of economic development potential. Yeah. So that's this is the a way question, I understand. Yeah, on, on everybody's minds and it, it's been heightened in the discussion of the Paris negotiations because if there are issues like climate change that weighs, weighs on everybody, and as I mentioned earlier, one thought is that oh, this is an issue that will come up later, not yet, although we're seeing natural disasters destroying livelihoods and lives in our own lifetime. Still, there is a thinking, well, you know, can we get our current problems done because resources are tight, sustainability looks like a long-term thing, that's a luxury, we can wait on that. I think the evidence says that you cannot wait on that because the costs are right now. Nothing is probably dramatized at uh, this, uh, this point more than fossil fuels, coal in particular, uh, versus renewables, uh, cleaner fuels on the other hand. There is a presumption that coal is cheaper and so um, cheaper energy is what you need. Accessibility to just energy is probably one of the greatest uh, needs uh, in terms of reducing poverty. So that has to be have given priority. At the same time, uh, fossil fuels also hurt your health uh, and hurts the environment and certainly uh, messes up the climate. And you just have to uh, breathe or try to breathe in Delhi or try to breathe in Beijing. Uh, and you know, you will immediately be a convert that pollution reduction is part of reducing poverty. So these things dramatize the dilemma. <clears throat> a quick answer would be that if you really valued fossil fuels and coal by their true value, uh, so take away all the subsidies like uh, on Thailand, there was a nice comment this morning, Indonesia, India. Uh, so take away the subsidies for uh, coal and fossil fuels. And then on top of that, put a tax for the health damage that it costs causes people. It's, it's a matter of life and death. Uh, so you, when you do that, then the price difference between uh, the uh, polluting fuels and the non-polluting ones like renewables disappears. Right now they're very competitive. It doesn't mean that you, can't, you shouldn't do anything. Government intervention would still be necessary to make this happen. Government is the one who puts taxes and not taxes. So you need the government intervention. So when you put it that way, to some extent, this uh, dilemma gets reduced. So in the interest of poverty reduction, and in true poverty reduction, and in the interest of sustainability of all the people over the time, you do sustainable, environmentally sustainable growth. You're not doing it because you want to do a favor, uh, but you're doing it because that is what is best. So that's, that doesn't mean that there are no conflicts and trade-offs. There really are. Uh, so we can differentiate between two kinds. One is the so-called win-win win-win uh, programs. The energy, uh, the professor this morning was very uh, articulate on the energy issues. If you can improve energy efficiency, that takes care of so many things at the same time. Good for the environment, good for the economy, good for en efficiency, good for the exchequer. So we go for that. That's win-win-win. But then there are the so-called net win. Some win and some lose. But overall you still win. That's where the political economy point comes in. And then we have to work very hard, like the first panel talked about, to get that done. So sustainability clearly looks uh, promising. But I like to argue that if we didn't have sustainability, you will not have poverty reduction in the future. So then the question would be less to ask ourselves whether countries have, can afford 
<coughs> to take steps toward more susta environmental sustainability, but more can country uh, afford not, not to take to. steps towards more sustainable right. development? Mm -hmm. uh, for, about evaluation and uh, standardized uh, maybe approaches to evaluation in the region. So th th there were, uh, I think, uh, two questions. Parts, One was, yeah. uh, um, is the ASEAN economic community uh, is, uh, integration one possible way to ensure that there's a harmonized approach to evaluation? And I, I would say yes, and I, I hope that the ADB will be working with them uh, on this, that uh, this evaluation policy is something that uh, would probably be, need to be more, uh, it's an opportunity anyway, uh, to be coordinated. Mm -hmm. This evaluation win elections, uh, I not necessarily. Uh, it depends, of course, on, on, on what they find. Uh, and so I would argue that part of that policy has to be that independence has to be built in to make sure that it's not self-serving from uh, any point of view. Another question that actually just uh, was, was raised, and maybe you would be able uh, then to respond to that, is more specific on ASEAN. Uh, the question is, how can we prevent the rise and spread of populist sentiments across ASEAN? Of course, we would be able to raise the same question for Europe or for other regional cooperation. But uh, do you think uh, that that's uh, something that's starting to be a real threat to the ASEAN what economic the community? Sorry, Veronique. Um, how can we prevent the rise and spread of populist sentiments across ASEAN, which could impede regional integration? particularly the building of a fully integrated ASEAN economic community? I think uh, it would be, uh, you cannot uh, prevent the rise and spread of populist sentiments if people are still addicted to government assistance. That's my blunt answer. Um, uh, people are used to uh, getting easy money in Thailand as well. We have learned a lesson. Um, what we, uh, so in my answer, to this would be um, to use the words of my uh, late king. He said, um, uh, we have to teach people how to catch a fish, not giving them the fish, because otherwise they cannot survive when their fish is gone. So um, um, in order to, you know, this is, I would say it's close to impossible, but we have to, uh, to, to uh, slowly retreating from uh, giving uh, free money to free people, to, to people, and so they would not uh, expect it, but uh, teach them how to uh, to use more carrot, right? And I, on this, okay, that's one thing I, I think the EU can give uh, ASEAN or Thailand's lesson. When I was in uh, the EU, uh, we had to study very uh, in closely in detail the cap policy. You know, okay, the cap is a beast in the EU, but um, uh, that's one thing that is good. The EU is trying to uh, re, re uh, direct uh, the uh, the policy of agricultural subsidies from giving uh, money freely to having incentive. <coughs> People have to do something good before they get money in the EU. I think Thailand should emulate that, and I think uh, ASEAN can also emulate that. They have to like protect environment. They have to set aside uh, some areas for uh, you know. Uh, crop rotation, that kind of things. You cannot get things for free. Uh, if you can uh, do that, then uh, probably uh, the getting free money would uh, be, be overcome. But, uh, you know, frankly, I, I am not very hopeful. Thank you. Thank you very, <laughs> very much. Okay, there are many questions that we won't be able to answer. There are questions about migration, which is a topic that we didn't touch upon. A uh, question about... Uh, Neighbor countries that are maybe less developed, and so about the disparities across uh, uh, of countries across the, the region. So many questions that still needs to be discussed. But I would ask you to conclude now, since we only have a few minutes left, by one or two sentences or key words that you want, key messages you want the audience to keep after this discussion on regional cooperation. So who wants to to start? Well, maybe I will just give some elements from the discussion itself. We discussed a lot about uh, regional cooperation, not just as an opportunity, an economic opportunity, but as a necessity, an economic necessity, but also a necessity for more existential 
issues like climate change and environmental issues. We talked about knowledge and knowledge being sure, that should be considered as a public good and how knowledge is actually the, uh, the essence of uh, positive regional cooperation and integration. And we talked, of course, about challenges that remain, this challenge of sustainability in the long term, and uh, whether countries with low income uh, levels can afford it. But more importantly, also the question of making regional cooperation more inclusive. So how do you make sure that everybody benefits from more regional integration and, and, uh, and uh, cooperation? So in a word, actually, how to make regional cooperation work for the people and not just for a few in the countries. So those were the highlights of our discussion. If you have anything that you want to add or to insist upon before we conclude. I just have one more word. Yes. Um, I didn't talk much about sustainability, but my two, my two key words for the future integration is not, uh, it's not only integration by itself, but I want uh, two key words, inclusiveness and sustainability. But sustainability, in my view, goes beyond environmental sustainability. Yes. Yeah. I'm looking at sustainability in the way that it would encompass like social issues, uh, labor, workers, human, uh, corporate, uh, you know, CSR stuff, uh, good governance. So for me, in the future, uh, when we think about sustainability, I, I would urge you to think about how to balance, the keyword is balance, you know, so that uh, our future integration and economic development uh, will be sustainable as well as uh, inclusive. Thank you. Any key words that you want to highlight, Mayne? Just one thing. I think uh, one of the things I heard uh, today and um, uh, especially this afternoon is inclusivity and how, how, how important that is. And I think of the SDGs, of course, uh, looking not just... Uh, uh, average effects of different inter interventions, but looking at how it differentiates across different in groups, uh, men, women, different income groups, different ethnicities is going to be key. I think we shouldn't underestimate that this will actually cost us more in terms of looking at these effects, because that means that we have to look at uh, more in its aggregated way uh, what, these, uh, what these effects are. Thank you. Just one word that, um, can you hear? Right? Yes, yeah, fine. So, yeah. uh, one word that um, Manny has talked about uh, evaluation, and there are surprises in evaluation. So whether it's inclusion or sustainability on the environmental side or good governance, um, you, you're surprised by some of the findings that you get from evidence-based evaluation, and that requires an open mind to change your thinking uh, as you go along. Thank you. Yeah, William? Yeah, just listening to the discussion about the regional integration and was a word which, which uh, two words which uh, came across very often. Another word was uh, two words which uh, came across often in this discussion was public goods. Yeah. And we are trying to, 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 to link them with themselves. I would say maybe a definition of one of the definitions of regional integration might be that it is, let's say, the embodiment of, uh, of uh, regional integration, the embodiment of the provision of public good at the country level, so that regional okay. integration at least has a task that, that, uh, to, to, to smooth out the difference between countries in order to, 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 to show them uh, what a regional public good might be of certain actions. I think that's well, thank you very issue. much. And all of uh, your concluding words actually show also that there is need for more evaluation <laughs> in the future to learn from it. So thank you very so much. I'm evaluating Thailand again. <laughs> Well, there is much to evaluate everywhere. <laughs> so please join me in thanking our panelists. And uh, thank you very much for this. Thank you. I thank you to the audience for this. We have the opportunity to launch uh, a book, a book entitled "Climate Ch Focused on Climate Change and Its Effect on Natural Disasters. And uh, just by way of background, be before I give the floor to the Vice Dean of the Economics Faculty of Tamasad University, um, as most of you know, climate change is a, a subject very close to Vinod Thomas's uh, heart, as you could also uh, uh, so, as you also saw in the, in the last um, session. Um, he has been writing and publishing on the subject of climate change for a long, long time. And in many ways, uh, the book that will be launched now 
is the culmination of years and years of, um, of efforts, research and publication in this um, field. It was done also as his last um, major work before we not left uh, the independent evaluation department of the um, ADB. So in many ways it was um, quite a, a milestone um, project. It was also uniquely done as a co-publication between Transaction, which is part of Rutledge, and the ADB, which as far as I, concern, uh, as far as I know was also a unique example of, um, of this type of publication. So without further ado, I, would, I have the honor to invite the Vice Dean of the Economics Faculty of Thammasat University to say a few words about um, Vinod's book, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce you uh, a really high quality new book on the issue of climate change and natural disaster. Uh, if I have to say one thing about the book, uh, uh, the thing I would say is that this book is uh, beyond my expectation. So I would like to uh, take this opportunity to congratulate and to thank uh, uh, Dr. Vinod Thomas, uh, the author, for uh, the time and energy he put into uh, writing this brief but comprehensive short book so that we can, uh, we all can learn from him. I would have to say that uh, I have never met uh, uh, Dr. Vinod before. Uh, uh, the only thing I knew was that he worked for the ADB and uh, I didn't know what kind of work he did or what kind of research he was doing. So the first time I seen the book, okay, I just read the title and that's all the information I have about the book. Okay, so the name is, the, the title of the, of the book is Climate Change and Nat Natural Disaster and the subtitle is uh, Transforming Economies and Policies for a Sustainable Future. Okay, so that's all the information I have for the first day I, I have this book. So, as a lot of you would expect, uh, my first feeling was that, uh, of course, this is a book about uh, climate disaster. So, so uh, probably it's going to talk about uh, the, what ha has already happened so far in terms of uh, climate disaster and uh, what we, or what the scientists uh, would expect to happen in the future uh, if the climate change problem accelerates. Uh, so for the people who are climate junkie like I am, uh, perhaps you would also expect it to talk about the issue of uh, loss and damage or climate risk, exposure and vulnerability and more importantly about climate uh, adaptation and climate adaptation policy. Of course the book does cover all those topics but it also spent a large part of its pages uh, discuss other things uh, and in essence advance a very important insight that I feel often omitted and even objected by a number of climate researchers or even uh, uh, international climate negotiators, especially the ones from the developing countries. So let me uh, go a little bit into the details of the book. Okay, as I said, this is a brief and comprehensive book on climate change. Uh, comprehensive in a sense that uh, with only 150 pages, it managed to cover most of the important points, important messages that the general public should know, that the policy maker need to know in order to, uh, if we are going to develop a sound climate, national climate policy, so this book discusses about climate disaster, uh, but it uses uh, climate dis disaster as the starting point, or uh, as the springboard to jumpstart the conversation, and it uses 
the disaster, climate disaster as a threat to connect various aspects, uh, various important aspects that related to climate change. So uh, the book starts with uh, some uh, general background information on climate change, then it goes on to discuss the anatomy of climate-related uh, natural disaster and the relationship between climate change and, and climate disaster. And then it spent the two major chapters on the uh, discussing about the uh, two types of uh, two types of actions that we could do to to combat the problem of climate change. Uh, those are the climate change mitigation, which means the reduction of the greenhouse gas uh, emission. Uh, and climate adaptation or, and disaster management. So in terms of mitigation, the book discusses both the te technical aspects as well as the policy aspect that would support the, the actions on climate mitigation. Similarly, for the adaptation side, the book uh, cover a lot of different uh, case studies of uh, successful adaptation to uh, disaster uh, that happened around the world and as well as the policy aspect that would uh, encourage or strengthen the attempts to, to, to allow better adaptation in the future. After discussing these two main aspects of uh, uh, climate strategies or climate policy, uh, then the book turns to uh, the issue of policy uh, focusing on how to transform the mindsets, motivations, and politics related to climate change. So uh, it discussed a lot of issues that related to uh, climate education, how to raise awareness, and uh, also look at what happened in terms of climate politics and uh, discuss of the possible approach that would, we could encourage uh, international climate cooperation and the last, the last chapter is uh, the conclusion of the, in a way, it's the conclusion of the book at which uh, uh, the author suggests that, or uh, make a convincing case that um, there is an urgent need uh, for a new development paradigm. Uh, the one that incorporates climate change into uh, development planning, or as a lot of people in the climate change field uh, tend to say, mainstreaming climate change into development planning. I'm going to end my introduction by reading a short excerpt from the, excerpt from the book. Okay, so this is from page 10 uh, for, of the book. Uh, uh, we not say that climate prevention, which of course include both uh, climate mitigation and uh, climate adaptation ought not to be viewed as a cost to economic growth, but an investment. In fact, growth cannot be projected to continue without con integrating climate impact and actions into the growth scenario. Uh, shifting to a low carbon growth tra trajectory is essential. So I agree with, completely with his conclusion and that in my introduction here. So at this point, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Vinod Thomas to come up here to the stage so we can do a ceremonial launching of the book. <laughs>